If you know your party's extension, please dial it now. Houston, we have a problem. I'm sick of all this complaining all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Hey listeners, welcome back to Multitasking in Heels. We're your hosts, Liz and Lindsay, and we're grateful to have you here with us today. We hope your week was stress-free, stain-free, and swear-free, but let's face this, that's not reality. I know my week was spent freaking out about work deadlines, unclogging the toilet 17 times because I can't figure out if my eight-year-old has too much fiber or too little fiber in his diet, and muttering, what the fuck, every time I find an empty candy wrapper hidden under the couch. I mean, seriously, every time I'm in downward facing dog, I'm like, another Snickers wrapper? So anyway, if you can relate to any of that, you have come to the right place. Um, so Lynn, how was your week? Uh, my week was good. Um, I was super excited because it's the most wonderful time of the mm -hmm. year. And we got to go get our Christmas tree. And we always go to the same place. It's this cute little farm. And the weird thing is that every single year, the trees keep disappearing. I mean, like they used to have two full weekends where you could go and get trees. And the last three years, there's less and less trees, which is really sad. I don't know if they're growing less or like they're drought just, related or something yeah they're just not coming up but they're also bringing trees in that are pre-cut so it makes me laugh because my husband brings a saw every year and he's like ready to cut something down <laughs> and we always end up with pre-cuts mm -hmm. so we go today and we get there early because we know that it's a not so secret place anymore and we stand in line and it's like black friday <laughs> and it's like this guy is like standing at the front of the line and he's like ready to say go and everyone's masked up mm -hmm. and he finally starts letting people in and right as he's about to let people in there's cars on the street coming in from both sides and the other guy yells one in one out oh my God. stay in the street so there's tons of people so it's like your heart starts beating fast and you're like oh my god i gotta get a tree so we run in and we know the deal that mm -hmm. if you find something you like you have to stand post so we tell my son to stand at the tree and he starts following us. And I'm like, stand at the tree. Guard it with your life. Yeah. And we learned our lesson last year because uh, my son and I were supposed to guard a tree and we were like people watching. And as we were people watching, our tree got taken oh. from behind our backs. So... We put our son at the tree. We go and find another tree because we did the nice deed of mm -hmm. finding my in-laws a tree mm -hmm. because they're not going out as much because of COVID. So we get the two trees. We get out of there. And on our way out, both ways to get in is backed up oh a mile each. And then... My husband is like, don't look in the cars. People are giving us dirty looks because we were also leaving with two, two trees. Tre oh my gosh. And as we're leaving, there's a third entrance to get in and that's backed up a mile. Wow. It was crazy, super crazy, but it was awesome because it was like, we got a deal and we got in and we got out. And the tree looks lovely. I saw it on my way in. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we were pretty excited. <laughs> Um, my flat moment was that my son had called a couple of his friends to come hang out and both friends that he called were quarantined Aww. and they're different friends from different groups and they both are quarantined from sports Aww. and on the 
bright side, I guess people are being safe, mm -hmm. but it's still so sad that the circle is getting smaller. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So. Which is in a way, not surprising, I suppose, is, you know, people do more and whatnot, but it's just it's so sad that our kids had started to have an opportunity to, you know, play sports, see friends, whatnot, and you see their self-esteem go up and they're excited and the light returns to their eyes. And now if we're starting to go backwards, that really does worry me. Yeah, me too. What about you, Liz? So... My pump moment, um, I don't know when this episode is airing, but again, we pre-record. So my pump moment um, was actually Thanksgiving. So, and it was, you know, a very COVID Thanksgiving as it was for everybody where it was just us, just my husband, the three kids and myself. Um, I almost feel bad saying it was my pump moment because I know like my parents were lonely, my in-laws were lonely, but as Danny pointed out, he goes, this is the most relaxed I've ever seen you on a holiday. <laughs> So, um, and it was really nice because we did take the time to just sort of enjoy having a low-key day and enjoy being together. Like Avery and I made dessert together um, while we were waiting for the, we grilled a turkey breast. And so that took a couple hours to cook. So while we were waiting for that, the little ones and I put out our indoor Christmas decorations, um, which was really nice. And we ate later than I thought we would. So the kids were like starving by the time we sat down, which has actually worked in our favor because they scarfed down the turkey. They ate all everything on their plates. And normally we do not have these lovely, like Hallmark-esque family dinners. I mean, a lot of times we're like yelling at the kids to stop fighting. One day, a couple weeks ago, Avery and I actually left the table and sat by ourselves at the kitchen counter because Will and Brady were being so obnoxious. So that's generally the theme of our family dinners. But for whatever reason, I don't know if the kids were like, we want this to be special for mom and dad, or it was the Thanksgiving karma was looking down upon us. We had a really, really nice family meal. Um, and I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I ordered some um, Thanksgiving themed rubber ducks in the mail. <laughs> so um, unfortunately it poured rain um, and the, our, the ground was all wet on Thanksgiving. So we couldn't do our quote unquote little rubber ducky turkey hunt on Thanksgiving. But my parents stopped by the next day for a little backyard COVID visit with the grandparents. So I thought that that would be a nice thing to do while they were there. So Danny went out and hid all the, the little rubber duckies in the front and the backyard. And my parents came over and, you know, the kids went off and found the ducks and my parents got to kind of see the fun and all that. And we had a nice little visit with them. Um, and they, you know, they were lonely, but they totally understood that the situation is what it is. And at the end of it, like I look back, we actually had a really nice family day. So I will chalk that up to my, my pump moment. That's great. Uh, my flat moment involves my daughter, my eight-year-old little girl. Um, so when we get comments on our YouTube videos, uh, we get emails sent to our multitasking in heels Gmail account, letting us know we got a comment and what that comment was. So I check our, our Gmail on my phone. And I'm like, oh my gosh, people commented on our video. I got all excited. And so I open up the emails and I was like, huh. So the first comment was, you guys talk about some weird stuff. The second comment was, but you peeps look pretty. And the third comment was, especially the blonde. Now, if you guys don't know what we look like, Lindsay's the blonde. So I was like, what the heck? And, um, and then I noticed that the profile picture next to the comment was my profile picture from my personal Gmail account. And I'm like, what is going on here? So I call over my oldest, Will. I'm like, Will, did you post these comments on our YouTube videos? He goes, oh, no, I would never call you pretty. <laughs> I was like, you're right, you wouldn't. And he said, it must've been Avery. I said, no way, Will, she's eight. She definitely didn't do this. And then I was like, oh, she did do this because 10 minutes ago, she asked me how to spell especially. So <laughs> I look over and she's just innocently sitting at the kitchen counter on her Chromebook, which is supposed to be used for schoolwork only, but we've gotten a little lax with that. Uh, and I said, Aves, did you comment on our podcast videos? She was, yeah. And I was like, well, that's inappropriate. You, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to be looking at those. Cause I, I didn't watch the videos. I said, but still, I said, the comments were weird. I'm, I'm deleting them. Please don't, don't do that. And she goes, no one is going to see these anyway, because no one watches you. No offense. <laughs> 
So God help me when she's 15 and has all these fake social media accounts that I don't know anything about where she's posting pictures of herself, like drunk and dressed like a whore at some like senior captain of the football team's party. I mean, someone just put me out of my misery right now. <laughs> oh so God. that's my flat moment. My daughter's a hacker and she's totally insulting. Yeah. <laughs> she loves you though. <laughs> um, when you sent those to me and I read the whole commentary to my husband, he was dying because first Liz thought we were hacked by a creep. Yes. And that, that I would, better. and that I was going to be sold into slavery. Yes. And when we found out it was Avery, um, Brian just started laughing so hard. Mm -hmm. And then her comment, no one watches you anyways. He, my husband was rolling. <laughs> it was just too out of the mouths of babes, as right? they say. Yes. So, um, so listeners, let's prove my daughter wrong. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, all right. So anyway, let's get into today's topic. Um, today we wanted to talk about how the roles of mothers and fathers have evolved over the decades, thinking about how life was for our grandparents compared to our parents, compared to how we're raising our families with our husbands. Um, and so I looked into a couple of statistics just to sort of set the stage for this. Um, and in 1955, 27% of the workforce was made up of working mothers. In 1985, that percentage rose to 62%, and in 2019, 72%. Um, and as of 2017, 41% of mothers were the sole or primary breadwinners for their families, earning at least half of their total household income. Um, and that's, I don't know why that percentage surprised me. It shouldn't as a working woman. And we know plenty of, of women who are on par with their husbands or who are the breadwinners. Um, but yeah, 40% of, 41% of women are, are the breadwinners in, in their household. Um, and so the role that women play in the household has definitely evolved over this past several decades. Um, and we came across this article that appeared in a 1955 issue of Good Housekeeping Monthly titled, The Good Wife's Guide, which details all of the ways that a wife and mother should act and how she can be the best partner to her husband and a mother to her children. Uh, but when you read this article though, there doesn't seem to be a ton of quote unquote partnership going on here. And quite honestly, it doesn't really paint fathers and husbands in the most positive light either. Um, they, in my opinion, they come across as these one dimensional, man like figures um, that just are supposed to make money and make the rules. And then the wife is supposed to take care of everything else. Um, so we thought it'd be funny to share some of these quote unquote rules, which many of which are probably the way our grandparents handled child raising and compare that to how our parents raise us and how we're raising our families. I know for me, you know, my grandmother, obviously, you know, she stayed home, she had five kids. And I remember being at her house, um, she always kept a tube of lipstick in a kitchen drawer. And went before my grandfather would come home, she'd like touch up her lipstick and touch up her hair and everything. Um, and my mom, she stayed at home with my two sisters and I, when we were growing up, she ultimately ended up getting a job as a nursery school teacher when I went to college and my sisters were still in high school, but she was home. She was a stay at home mom, you know, our entire childhood. Um, that was sort of what she believed in. I'm sure that there were times financially where maybe it would have been better off if she got, you know, a job. Um, but that wasn't, you know, the way she wanted to raise her, her kids. Um, so Lynn, what about your mom? She, she worked, right? Yeah. So my Nana also did not work mm -hmm. and my Papa was a salesman, but it's funny that you mentioned the lipstick mm -hmm. hidden in drawers because that exactly was the case. Mm -hmm. And my mom worked, she was a teacher, a full-time teacher, and she did, um, she had a big plate or for a teacher. Mm -hmm. She made sure that she was always planning and correcting papers and not the teacher that turned off right at two or three. Mm -hmm. So we were at the same school as my mom. So we would stay with her after school. Oh. And so she usually came home. We still would beat my dad home. Mm -hmm. And she would make sure, though, that she came home and she usually started dinner before my dad got home. Yeah. So you actually got to witness your mom working. Yes. And be part of that all the time. Which is kind of interesting. And 
Yes, working and working mm -hmm. hard. And mm -hmm. we would go to school with her and she would show up an hour and a half before she had to start teaching. Oh, wow. And we always asked her, why do you get to school so mm -hmm. early? Because she beat almost all the other teachers. And she said, I've got a lot to do. I've got a lot of planning to do. And it taught my brother and I mm -hmm. the, I guess, work ethic that my mom had mm -hmm. and that she always stayed later than all the teachers too. That's great. Um, Cause I think most, if you're growing up in a house with you know, maybe your mom that stays home, you see the work ethic more from your dad and you don't really appreciate what your mom did until you have kids and understand that just because you're not working outside of the home, like that's still work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting. You got to see that from your, like literally got to see it from your mom's perspective. Yes. Um, all right. So let's dive into some of these rules. So rule number one for mothers and housewives in 1955, have dinner ready, plan ahead, even the night before to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is a way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. So my mom definitely did this growing up. She actually would have a handwritten menu that she kept in a kitchen drawer. So if we ever wanted to know what was going to be for dinner on Thursday, we could just open the drawer and be like, oh, okay, like spaghetti meatballs or whatever. It didn't, there wasn't a lot of variation from week to week, but anyway, she definitely planned everything out. She definitely had dinner ready for my dad when he got home. Um, and I would say, you know, for Danny and I, I, I probably still do do that. I mean, we're in COVID now we're home and whatever, but, um, prior to COVID, I was the one that picked the kids up from daycare or after school programs. So I'd be home earlier and I would generally have our dinner started before he got home. But a lot of times we would grill too. So he would partake in the cooking. So it's a little bit more even keel. I never felt, and I still don't feel it's like my responsibility to get dinner on the table. Like there's not a lot of planning involved in it. We say, what do you feel like? Okay, I'll get it. And Sometimes it's me cooking the whole thing. Sometimes it's him cooking some of it, but it's a little bit more of a, a partnership. It's not, I'm the wife, so I'm responsible for the cooking. So this is where we differ. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my mom always came home and funny thing, she also had a list mm -hmm. uh, pre what was on the menu. It was on the refrigerator though. Mm -hmm. And um, I also thought it was pretty BS, even as a little girl, that my we just had a super long day with my mom, mm -hmm. and we were our we were her kitchen helpers, and we would have to come home after the long day and then help in the kitchen for my dad to get home, like breeze in, right. make a cocktail for him and my mom, and then beat feet to like the shower or the sauna mm -hmm. and I'd be like what the, the sauna the such a west coast thing <laughs> it was an 80s thing too totally 80s thing yes and so I just thought it was weird because my dad was a lawyer and we knew like my brother and I knew and my mom that he had liquid lunches with his mm -hmm. buddies and drove his Harley on a good day to the court to show up for 15 minutes for the case to be dismissed. Oh my God. So I was like, is this really fair? And also my mom cooked like the same thing. There wasn't a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. And so my mom also tried to cook his favorite meals. And my dad had the taste buds of an old man on the German Dutch border. <gasps> from the old lands. So my brother and I hated a lot of the mm -hmm. meals we got served. And these were the days when you couldn't be picky like right. our kids are. You, you had to eat what was on your plate. Mm -hmm. So the those days I just thought wasn't very fair. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into what happens at my house and probably later topics. But here's rule number two, prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup, put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. 
He's just been with a lot of work weary people. Again, the only work weary people my dad was around were the waitresses bringing him free <laughs> vodka tonics with his buddies or the bailiffs or the court reporters. But yes, my mom did always look nice. If it wasn't COVID, um, for me at my house, if it wasn't COVID, I'd literally be running through the door and the boys mm -hmm. would literally be looking at me going, what's for dinner? Mm -hmm. So at my house, Liz, <laughs> that is what happens here. And now, I don't know. Like, yeah. How did that happen? How did that expectation get set? I have no idea. <laughs> I think my husband forgot that when he was wooing me and he cooked, he used to own a pub and he used to cook when he had to, that he ha doesn't have those skills anymore, which scares me because he's teaching our son right. that. Mm -hmm. So there's been nights where I turn on them and look at them and say, I don't know, what is for dinner? Yes, that's interesting. When I, so when I look at the way my husband was raised, um, super traditional as well, you know, like his mom stayed home. Um, and even to this day, if we're down, you know, at his parent before when we could have dinner, you know, at his parents' house, his mom always makes sure that his dad has everything he needs and like we'll all be sitting at the table ready to eat and his dad will say like where's the balsamic vinaigrette and she gets up and goes and gets it instead of recognizing you know him I and mean, he's an adult he's perfectly capable of recognizing that the salad dressing he wants isn't on the table and he could walk the 30 feet to the refrigerator and get it himself but instead he makes a statement and she gets up and it's like that's the environment he grew up in. Um, thankfully, he's not like that. And his brother's not like that. You know, again, they're not, you know, sitting there at the table watching me and my sister-in-law clear the right. table and do the dishes. But that's how yeah. they grew up, very much so. And Brian's not like that, I have to say. He will always do the dishes. He'll always get up and get his own condiments or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to what's for dinner, mm -hmm. They, that's your responsibility. They look at me and he'll grill mm -hmm. or whatever, but it's like they both don't have capacity in their brains right. to think past. There is, a, so I do the same thing my mom did. There's a menu mm -hmm. like you do too. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to even like look at that uh -huh. and try and prep like, okay, we're going to have chicken sausages. Yeah. Let me go grill those. Oh, that would require being proactive, Lindsay. That's not... seriously <laughs> no. Doesn't happen in my house, and I yeah. gotta change that. Mm -hmm. It's that hard though. It would, you, you've sort of set this precedent. You've fallen into kind of these roles or whatever it is. And again, they're not rules, but it's just like this habit, right? Um, well, they've gotten enough backlash during COVID that yes. I think I think COVID has definitely even the playing field a little bit. Um, there's this, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but there's this article I read a few years ago called the default, who's the default parent? 99.999% of the time, it's the, the mother. And that being the default parent means that you are responsible for, you know, everything logistically that the, the kids in the household need. So every registration form, every sports sign up, every doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, um, every school project, every deadline, every picture day, every birthday present that needs to get bought, every, you know, basically the, you know, COO of your household. And that generally falls to the mom. And then that was definitely the case for me. And I would complain about it. But at the same time, I never said to Danny, like, can you do these three things? Because then I would be worried that those three things wouldn't get done. I would micromanage the shit out of him until he got totally bullshit. So it's just easier for me to be pissed that he's not doing it than to be all uptight that I can't control when he does it. So, but I think that now that we're home and everything's just all one environment, he sees all of those sort of defaulty things a lot more and there's a lot more of them now because we have to manage the kids remote learning and there's just so much more to stay on top of and he just organically has become more involved Helpful. in that stuff so i yeah. think that yeah the whole COVID situation has i mean hopefully evened that playing field a, a little bit 
Yeah, I definitely think it has, um, not to go off on a tangent, but I definitely think it has. Brian definitely has helped in that yep. um, category. Uh, the food prep not being Not one. so much. <laughs> but yeah, as far as like looking fresh for your husband when they come home, I mean, again, pre-COVID, I would have, you know, be home before Danny, trying to make the kids their dinner, trying to keep them from fighting, still answering work emails. I mean, he'd come in the door and he, a lot of times he'd hear me yelling or he'd come in the door and I was too tired. I wouldn't even say hi. Like, <laughs> like that's how I was greeting him. And I was still, you know, still wearing whatever I wore to work today. Cause I didn't have time to go upstairs and change. And, you know, there was definitely no feeling fresh. There was definitely, you know, making sure the kids' faces are clean and they run over and greet their father. Cause they're so excited to see him. It was like, knock it the fuck off. Oh, you know? <laughs> and then he's like, Oh, great. Like, I'm sure there are times he opened the door and wished he could have silently closed it and then back. snuck away. <laughs> Turtled back into totally. the garage. Totally. Um, so let's see. The next rule I have is number six. Over the cooler months of the year, you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel he has reached <laughs> a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. After all, Lindsay, catering to his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. No one will ever describe my house as a haven of rest and order. <laughs> it is a disaster. <laughs> and I don't think I would get immense personal satisfaction catering to his comfort at all. I think I would just find immense personal resentment. So I will say though, my mom never lit a fire for my dad, but she definitely made sure the house was in order. And that's my mom too. Anyway, she's a very type A, she's very control freak. Everything has a place, everything in its place. So the house was, you know, totally squared away before he came home. My poor husband, on the other hand, builds fires for me. And then I'll be sitting there in front of the fire all by myself. And I'll just yell at him from the other room. I think the fire's going out. <laughs> and he comes in to fix it for me. So yeah, there's no haven of rest and order in our house at all. Well, as I see it, you haven't booked him into Bellasante or the lodge at Sun Valley. <laughs> so the 1950s husband could take five after you've done all the other nice things and take a sip of his martini and make a damn fire if he wants one. That's right. In the 80s, my dad would actually do this, and he sometimes would make the cocktails when he got home. So, sidebar, I think this is accidentally where my bourbon whiskey Coke <laughs> came from. As my mom's drink of choice, I thought it was Coke, and I took a sip, and I was like, mm, Carol, this is a good choice. And I've never looked back. Oh, my God. <laughs> and as... My husband would say, yeah, that's what you do in California, <laughs> you weirdos. Um, but thank goodness we have a gas fireplace because I could say, sure, Brian, you want to you wanna fire? Quick. Um, but the other thing I was thinking is that women back then didn't know how to make a fire. I, that's what surprised me. I was like, what woman knows how to make a fire? There's no way. Yeah. I don't think so either. So... Anyways, so rule number seven, prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash the children's hands and faces if they are small. Comb their hair and if necessary, change their clothes. Obviously, the children were accessories. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, you pro probably couldn't find the kids because we were still goddamn outside right. until the lights went out. And... Everyone was okay with that. And now our son could literally smell like throw up mm -hmm. and BO, AKA hockey smell. And my husband finally might notice and be like, oh yeah, maybe you should go take a shower. So it literally doesn't bother him. Exactly. Yeah. No, in my house, oh my God. What? remember to tell the kids to wash their hands before dinner. Brady comes over and his like nails are all, you know, dirt in ground. I'm like, you've got to use the scrubber, buddy. You can't eat food with hands like that. You know, Avery's hair is like all crazy. When I do Will's laundry, I'm like, how come I folded nine pairs of shorts, but only two pairs of underwear? How, where, 
did you lose the underwear? Or are you just not changing it? You know, like just disgusting. I mean, just forget about combing the hair, especially in COVID. I call them my feral children because they're just out running all around and whatever. Um, you get what you get and you don't get upset in our house. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> that is it. Um, so the next rule, this, this is my personal favorite. Number 14, don't complain if he's late home for dinner or even if he stays out all night. Count this as minor compared to what he might have gone through, gone through that day. Uh, motherfucker, you don't come home, you better be dead in a ditch because I'm changing the locks. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I know. This was my favorite too. Yeah. How is that even a Count this reasonable as minor. thing to say? I yeah. don't know. Right. Don't worry if he's banging his secretary after hours. You know, he really needed just to let loose. He's had a stressful day, but make sure those kids' faces are clean. <laughs> I know. Ridiculous. I, I don't said, even have anything to say to that beyond what I just said. <laughs> I said, this will be my favorite rule. Count this as a minor infraction as what he might have gone through. So if you're a 1950s housewife and you followed all the rules, your dinner's ruined, your nice outfit is ruined, and your kids that you've cleaned up are back at it dirty and tearing one another up, and you cannot complain. So when my dad was this late, when we were kids, you better believe not only did he hear about it, but we heard about it all the way downstairs, and our neighbors three houses oh down God. heard about it because this did happen so i think it's very different for us now mm -hmm. because we have cell phones yes. and and find my friends so we literally have a tracking low jack mm -hmm. device on our husbands <laughs> seriously i so. can't even imagine um the next rule uh number 16 arrange his pillow and offer to take off his shoes, speak in a low, soothing, and pleasant voice. Um, arrange his pillow over his face, maybe? <laughs> These rules are just plain ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, speak in a low, soothing voice. Are we talking about a human being or like a puppy? I, this is what I mean when it doesn't paint the father in a very, or husband in a very good light. It, this makes him sound like he's he he needs childlike nurturing. It's absurd. Yeah. And the thing is, to be fair, like my papa, this was like when my papa was a yep. husband. I don't think he was this like bad and alpha yeah. male and like take care of me. Mm -hmm. Um but wow. It's insulting on multiple levels. <laughs> like, especially if you're home taking care of kids and now your other child, also known as your husband, comes home and needs you to take off his shoes. Jesus Christ. I mean, if I ever said that to my husband, like, honey, well, I'll take off your shoes. You know, would you like a drink? He'd be like, what, be like, what are you doing? <laughs> no, he'd be like, Liz, what did you do? I know. <laughs> he even want to know what you did. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So another one of my favorites is number 17. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. Sounds like a cartoon like king. Like, you know what I mean? Like someone from like a Disney movie. Don't question my fairness and truthfulness. Um, so even though my dad, my dad worked and was the sole financial support for our family, I never saw him in any way, shape or form hold that over my mother or feel like he was entitled to be the sole decision maker and what he said goes or anything. You know, I think that they did have a real partnership and my dad taught my sisters and I from a pretty young age, the importance of hard work, the importance of earning your own money, the importance of budgeting your own money, because it was very important. He said to us, I don't want you have to, to have to ever rely on anyone to take care of you. Um, and he raised three daughters who believe in hard work, who, who you know, understand um, the importance of saving money and budgeting and earning money and, and, and all of that. Um, and I think it was important for him having daughters to make sure that, that we could be very self-sufficient. Um, 
and you know, my mom, even though she didn't work, you know, her outside of the home, her, she, you know, worked really hard to make sure that my sisters and I had everything we needed, that the house was always in order, that we got to where we needed to go and all of that. Um, but she had one night a week where she got together with her girlfriends and they still to this day get together every week. And these are like it's two of my aunts and a couple of childhood girlfriends. So my mom is in her seventies. So she's known these people for over 60 years. Um, so still once a week they get together, but I remember growing up, they would each take turns getting together at each one of their houses. But my mom, before she went out, would always make sure that my sisters and I were fed and we were bathed and we were ready for bed, which now as a mom blows my mind because the whole, like the silver lining of the girls night is you don't have to do any of those things. You leave it to your husband. You're like, I'm going to skedaddle you figure it out. Um, but she, you know, when I said that to her and she was like, oh no, we would never dream of doing that. Um, it, it would never have even occurred to her. And I know my dad was never like, you better make sure those kids are fed and ready for bed by the time I come, came home. Like, that's not who my dad is. But she felt it was her responsibility to do that. So my dad didn't have to do it after he came home from work. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. um, yep. So it's funny that you said that. So it was kind of exactly the same at my, with my parents. My mom always had a Thursday night girls night mm -hmm. and with her friends, they were all teachers um, from different schools that she started at a certain school and then got a job somewhere else, but they all stayed roughly in the same area. And my dad and her were true like partners of deciding where they were going to live, what they were going to do. Um, and I completely remember this at one point when California was going to raise taxes again. And my dad's like, we're going to move to Idaho. <laughs> and my mom goes, no, we're not. And the compromise was that we would go there for vacations and we got a condo there. And it was one of those things though that you know they talked about mm -hmm. and my mom was like that's too big of a move we gotta ask the kids and they asked us and i was like no i am not mm -hmm. moving to potato land right. and the funny thing is as adults we're like this is heaven up mm -hmm. here but as a kid, you don't want to do that. No, because yeah. you feel like you're totally uprooting your life and your friends and what, I, what am I going to miss out on and all that. Right. And I'm glad that we didn't. But that was one of those big mm -hmm. questioning moments, questioning the master. Yes. Yes. And my mom and dad talked about it mm -hmm. and it was decided and we didn't go. So... Now for you and Brian, when you guys have had to make kind of major life decisions, like the decision to move from, you know, Idaho to the East coast, were you guys both on, do you find that you guys are both on the same page when it comes to big life decisions or do you come at it from different perspectives? You know what we have been, um, it's funny, Brian doesn't, he's not the best communicator and <laughs> he holds it in mm -hmm. until the last minute yeah. and then he blurts it all out. That's how I am. Yeah. And <laughs> Liz, Dan and I are still the same. I know. You and Brian are still the same. You guys can sit there with your freezing cold hands and communicate with each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> you and Brian can just stare sit at each other <laughs> and then blurt it all out at That's one hard. time. So, um, but when Brian finally blurts it out, it's the exact same page that I'm on. Mm -hmm. And so we were pretty much on the same page when we moved or considered moving. And the funny thing is, is we had talked about it at the beginning of the recession. Yep. Um, if something goes down, what would we do? And that was January. And in May his bank got taken over and then we kind of already had a base mm -hmm. baseline of what we were going to do. And it was either San Francisco or Boston and our brothers were in San Francisco at the time, but we knew that his parents being in Boston were a bigger draw. Yep. And I'm, a little bit more of an adventurous spirit than my husband. Mm. So we came east. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's important to be on the same page about those major life decisions. And when I think about the stuff that Danny and I have argued about, it's always something dumb and little, and it's always caused by something dumb and you same know, insignificant. Same. Yeah. It's well, not the big no. Yeah. yeah. Which Definitely. is funny yeah. because you think those would be mm-hmm. the larger things that you could be on, on right off on different pages because yeah. those are the huge things that are tougher to be yes. on the same page. Yeah. And sometimes you have to be a little patient. Like I remember, you know, when we were trying to figure out if you know, Will had ADHD and having him tested and different things like that. He was a little bit slower to come around on certain things than I was. And he just needed time and he to kind of acknowledge certain things or recognize certain things or, or have conversations or whatever. And eventually we, you know, we got on the same page about it and, you know, we've made uh, certain decisions about the kids or the finances or the house or whatever it is, you know, together. But there hasn't been, you know, knock on wood, an incident where, we've dug our heels in because we are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, I think we both have a mutual respect for each other. Um, and, you know, sometimes someone might need just a little bit more time to come around and, but eventually we always agree like, yep, yeah, this makes the most sense. And I feel really good about this decision. Like I've never felt like I acquiesced to what he wanted and later right. been like, Ugh, I just did that. Cause I didn't feel like fighting about, it. you know, like, right. so yeah, uh, we've thankfully always been on the same page about those major things. Yeah, that's awesome. So our final, final rule is number 18. A good wife, Liz, always knows her place. Yes, mm-hmm. it's in the front seat of the car. That's right. Driving everyone around, doing all the shopping, making sure all the holidays go off without a hitch. Because if we weren't around, literally, there would be no Christmas. It is so true. Um, I always say to my kids, if anything ever happens to me, this delicate house of cards is going to come crumbling down. <laughs> You're all going to starve and walk around naked. <laughs> it's so true. It is uh, true. Um, all right. So should we share our celebrities? They're not just like us segment. Yes. Should we, which one should we start with? The That's- positive or the not so positive? Let's start with the not so yes. positive so, we so that we can end on a positive mm-hmm. note. So we actually, yeah, we have two to share this week. And the first one involves Johnny Depp, who resigned or was asked to resign. He was um, asked to yeah, resign. Yes, uh, from his role in the upcoming movie, Fantastic Beasts, after pressure stemming from him losing a libel suit against the Sun newspaper. So uh, several months ago, the Sun called Johnny Depp um, a, a wife beater and because of his relationship with Amber Heard and all of the messiness going surrounding their divorce. So he sued them for libel. He lost. He was asked to resign from his role in the movie. And despite resigning and only filming one scene, he'll still be paid $10 million. So who can sh- not show up to work mm-hmm. and make $10 million right. and, and be fired, really? Right. Because, because of beating your wife or allegedly beating your yes. wife. Yes. So Warner Brothers mm-hmm. just said, hey, we don't really like the fact that right. you were guilty mm-hmm. in, of your libel suit, at least. Right. Um, so that's not a good look for us. Mm-hmm. So your pay or play contract, we're just going to pay you. And you're not going to have to do the role anymore. Right. So bye, and here's 10 million. And here's 10 million. I mean, if he turns around and gives the 10 million to a, you know, a, a charity for domestic violence or something, I'll shut my mouth right now. Yes. But I have not heard that that is his plans. So I just find it kind of disgusting that someone doesn't have to show up for work and still gets paid $10 million, um, particularly why he was asked to resign and whether he is guilty of domestic violence or not I, I don't know but it's not a good look as you said um yeah i mean johnny Depp used to be really hot and now he just looks like a flamboyant pirate and it's really disappointing <laughs> i know that role really eked into his real life yeah yes yeah he definitely uh, the method Jack acting Sparrow. just went a little too far for yeah. me um so that's our sort of not great celebrities are not just like us so 
But, and on a more positive note, um, Johnny Wahlberg, you know, all the Wahlbergs will have a special place in my heart because they're Boston boys, left a $2,020 tip for a $35 meal for a waitress at a diner in Massachusetts. Um, and when he was asked about it, he just said, quote unquote, who's up next? And then hashtag 2020 tip challenge on the receipt, you know, I'm guessing in an effort to maybe get more celebrities to be generous to servers, particularly in light of COVID, these people have lost so much income. Um, and, you know, probably a lot of them are struggling. So granted, you know, he's in a position to leave hugely generous tips wherever he goes. And if you want to be cynical, he could say, oh, you could say he just did it for publicity. But even if that's the case, I don't really care. This waitress, you know, probably slept a lot easier that night knowing she wasn't going to have to worry so much about, you know, paying her bills that month. So I applaud you, Johnny Wahlberg. Thank you. So I looked into this further, Liz, and you, you will be even more ecstatic. Oh, good. Donnie and Jenny mm -hmm. started this on January 1st, 2020, mm. the 2020 tip challenge. Oh man. This is before they knew 2020 gonna was going to be the most giant shit show wow. of the world. So they started it mm -hmm. on that first Damn. and they've done it a bunch of times. And I think recently it just got picked back up because one it was massachusetts yep. his hometown but they did it at an ihop ihop no on way. january 1st in oh 2020 and then several other celebrities picked it up like i think it was adele and i'm not quite sure what other celebrities mm -hmm. did but it didn't catch on as much as it should have especially in light yeah. of the shit show and i think Donnie brought it back mm -hmm. because of how badly the frontline workers right. also being um, waitresses, waiters, mm -hmm. bartenders, yep. chefs have been like um, affected by mm -hmm. COVID. Yeah. I mean, I know we always try to do just our little part locally here by we get takeout from our local restaurants and try yeah, to leave generous huge tips, tips. And, you know, we're yeah. not... I personally am not in a position to leave a $2,000 tip. However, I, you know, we are in a position to get takeout from our local restaurants and do what we can because it is so important. So well, I hope it, I hope the trend continues into 2021 and yeah, you know, get just, more support for these people. I, I was so excited when I found that out that I was like, they started this in the on January 1st That's before crazy. he even knew this was going to be the worst year for everybody worst year ever. <laughs> but we're making the best of it, Lindsay. Exactly. So in closing, we want to remind you jolly old elves, we're all in this together. That your significant other or even your roommate is on your side. And if they aren't, get a new one. Trade in and trade up. Or do like the 1950s housewives and put on that fire, make that cocktail and get cozy. Because in one week and two days, this shit show is over. Turn the calendar over, turn our attitudes over to hopefully a new us and a new year. We're making new rules as housewives and new rules in 2021. That is, don't suck. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes and Spotify. That helps everyone find us, and we want to be found because we think from all the nice, positive feedback we've gotten, that this is helping a lot of people. So again, rate and review because it is helping. And thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone.